wow, that started instantly. Zoom is scaling up its service. <laughs> That's right. Welcome everyone to the Chaos Grimoire Lab working group call. Today is March 24, 2020. Um, thank you, Matt, for sharing the meeting minutes. If anyone joined late, I'll just put in the chat again. Please add yourself to the list of attendees and let us know how you are feeling today. And then we can, in the notes section, um, collect items that uh, we want to talk about today. And then Daniel, I know you usually lead these meetings. So if you want to um, take over, please go ahead. Oh yeah, definitely. So uh, Peter, thank you very much for, for the introduction and for, for being here. And thank you everyone else to, for being around. Uh, so, to give some more context to, to this discussion, the usual process we follow, and you, you can see this in the in the meeting notes, is um, we are trying to look, uh, well, we've been looking for specific use cases. From time to time, we bring use cases that matter to us. So, this is a very good opportunity. Uh, so, the process is kind of, we discuss kind of the use case, uh, any metric or business goal that you are trying to achieve. And then uh, what we are doing specifically in the Grimoire Lab uh, working group, uh, which is part of the software uh, side of things, is how can we go and implement this? And by this, we our idea is we discuss the we go for the for the for the business goal. Then we try to to find like a, a use case where scenario where you can play you have or we can mock up like a dashboard that might be useful for this use case or several dashboards. And then we look for, once we, we are happy with this, then we, we go and say, okay, so for this data might be in Git repositories and then in the uh, Slack channels plus Jira comments, I don't know. So then we look, uh, we, look we, we go and look for the information into the original data sources in the way that we need to create a specific data model. So Grimoire Lab, the architecture just in short is uh, going from the gathering information till this is visualized. So the first very part, the, the very first part is uh, uh, Python based, and uh, this is uh, in charge of retrieving and curating and dealing with certain issues in in this process in the software analytics field, as um, how to deal with identities, affiliations, how to uh, have the uh, same information across all of the indexes or data sources as, for instance, business units or companies. Um, and then uh, the next step is how to create all of this information, maintain, avoid this data decay process. And then at the very end, uh, the visualization, which is where, where you have there in terms of uh, uh, dashboards and so on. So Grimoire Lab right now, as open source project, this supports 30 different data sources. So from Git logs to GitHub issues, GitLab merge request to Jira or to Slack comments or mailing list communication channel. Um, and then it has, as far as I remember, around 70 different dashboards, which means that this has like 70 different use cases that we've, we've been basically adding to the, to the kind of the marketplace that we use. It's not the marketplace, but kind of the list, the catalog of dashboards that we have. So this is it. The very last discussions we've had to bring some more context is we've, we've had this discussion about hard and soft contributions. So we have two dashboards in this indeed right now, like in, in process. The first of them is this difference between hard and soft contributions, which is where this community value versus business value. Uh, so in this case, hard contributions were named as Commits. Well, this is this is the definition. Okay, you. This is a very let's say opinionated field. So we all like different colors, of course. But this is this is a, a specific use case. And then the other side of things is soft contributions, which is basically anything else. So from a community perspective, we may go and look at these two type of contributions. From a business perspective, which is the other use case we are trying to achieve here, was what are who are the newcomers and are they uh, 
will they be like uh, new business leads or marketing leads that we can uh, leverage at some point so then we can have this these two distinctions here the, the second uh, dashboard that we have in progress is uh, developers um, uh, work over the 24 hours of the of the clock and uh, we were dealing well Georg was dealing in, in this case with the technology and struggling a bit because this didn't work properly so we were in the process so we have the dashboard already in place uh, we were trying to export and then upload the, the dashboard as a new one to the to the community so uh, question for everyone we can start having this open discussion and bringing a new use case so I think it's perfectly okay for me, or we can keep advancing a bit more with the with the dashboards. So what do you think? Ha having Peter here, I think it's a really good opportunity to discuss about the use case. So I think it makes sense. I'm fine with that. Thank you, guys. I'd love to provide feedback. Oh, one more thing. Uh, my we have an intern um, in our lab in in our company, and uh, Jun Liang is our uh, is is from San Diego as well. He's a, he's a grad student who just graduated from a, a computer science department at mm -hmm. UCSD. Sounds good. Oh, um, we are located on UCSD campus, just, just for your background. And the school is completely shut down and they have, they just discovered COVID-19 cases. So it's, it's a oh, chaos over there. Take care. I haven't been there for a long time. Okay, so perhaps we can start with the with the use case. So, um, yeah, so maybe maybe Peter, uh, we we can uh, the way we we the method we follow is this goal question metric approach. So uh, this means that at the very beginning we are trying to understand and take notes of the business goals that you are trying to achieve, um, whatever they are. Um, and then with those business goals in terms of, for instance, we are trying to measure value for this reason. You don't really have to mention the reason. That might be a private reason and so on. So it's just to have kind of an understanding of what you are trying to follow. And of course, so the, the, the video is being recorded, but we can then edit the video if needed. So just in case you, uh, I don't, know, you don't feel comfortable with something you said and so on. So don't worry about that. Um, Send me a note if you want it edited. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can. Okay. Better be pause it before discussing something that is sensitive. Oh yeah, we we can stop recording. So, yeah. I I don't mind being recorded. <laughs> okay. So. Um. So then the the thing. So we have these goals, and then the idea is once we have the goal as I don't know measuring value in the open source, the value of working in the open. Uh, whatever uh, then the idea is to go with the specific questions that are, might be interesting and then we go for the metrics that matter if not the other way around we may face this issue about measuring the things that we are either able to measure or just for the pressure of measuring things we know how to measure things so then we start bringing metrics to the table so this is why we like to have this framework yeah. i added a structure in the meeting minutes so that we can ask i don't know maybe ask peter to talk about the use case and then as we are listening we can start taking notes and capture this so what do you think peter does it work for you how would you like to proceed sure <clears throat> let me uh this is the impromptu answer so let me think about that <laughs> the uh for so peter's use case um description is uh, we are building oss uh, library. That's that's the background. It's it's for deep scanning. Uh, deep scanning is when you copy and paste your source code, and then you um, either function level or file level or just a snippet level. We want to build the data sources where people can copy. Where we want to, where we can just look up against that database and then say, oh. This person has copied this type of open source, and then that comes from this uh, package and this version. When I was working at Qualcomm, these tools were very high in false positive. 
it's it's somewhat naturally it, it'll occur because of uh the nature of open source project people copy and paste their source code from other people so when you have one file that's copied over and over and over then it's really hard to tell where that origin of that particular file is um so that's that's kind of like the background <clears throat> the goal is to, sorry about that <laughs> the, the goal is to build a open source library that is um that is gonna have that is gonna provide low false positive rates which which means that uh if they're just copying and pasting source code and they didn't modify at all or if they're just creating hello world files or if they're creating the projects that are no longer relevant then our goal is to let's just filter them out in the very beginning so that at the end we create less false positive results to begin with so garbage in garbage out good data in good data out it's kind of deal so that's where I'm coming from to look at Grimoire Lab is they, you guys do provide a um, way to parse it, way to extract some of the git log information and who, how many authors are there, what is the la latest commits and et cetera. So those metrics, we actually internally process that as well, but I see that you have more list of features than uh, we have, uh, slightly different, but I, I'm willing to give out some of my, what we have worked on as well. And the uh, that's the goal. The other the other goal that we see from the cybersecurity perspective is that uh, current tools, SNCC for example, they have people who are actually looking at the keywords of the uh, log messages, and all they do is that they just log it and then they just report to the chain. They don't do a lot of. They require a lot of human efforts to analyze the log messages to see if there is a source cybersecurity issues. So what we would like to do is that can we actually create an AI agent that's going to go through and then uh, parse those things out. And uh, I believe that's very doable from the AI perspective. In order to do that, I see that you guys already got some of the Git issue messages and some of these messages out. So we'd like to add something to you know, parse and statistics. So something along that line, how many times the word buffer overflow occurs? How many times, you know, the uh, out of bounds type of error, you know, messages occur? Can we do some, because uh, currently people don't always send out the secure, security messages and updates. And we would like to have some type of automated uh, more up-to-date way of managing the open source software to the users of the software. That's the goal that we have um, as a company. Thank you for writing. <laughs> so my, my question is, uh, how do we, what, what's the state and the, uh, what, where, where do we, what's the best way to integrate your tools for these type of features? And the metrics, I'd like to know uh, which ones are implemented and working well, and the, which ones are something that it, you guys are considering so that can I actually take a look at those? I mean, I think I saw the list. I went through that one time. So, so maybe we, the how many of them kind of occur, map onto what, what I'm interested in? Because I know you guys have like seven use cases and you have many different ways of uh, ways these uh, features can be used. Um, so I'd like to be part of that process. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm looking right now. So the way uh, so, um, the way we are storing the data is we are using Elasticsearch, uh, the open source version, and then we are visualizing information uh -huh. using Kibana. So the point here, the interesting thing is that Kibana is is the one querying Elasticsearch to do to produce the specific metrics. So are there metrics uh, like a list of metrics we are currently tracking? The answer is just in a few cases, because in most of the cases, what we are doing is we are flattering all of the information we have and then doing certain indexes. And then Kibana is the one producing the final metrics. So uh, let me show you uh, the, following, the following example. So, well, indeed, I can share my screen. I think it's going to be faster. Mm, yeah. 
so let me share so I can show you this one I think uh, this would be this one so mm -hmm. so this is this is one of the projects you see I guess I assume uh, oh, let me minimize this uh, so Grimoire ELK so what we have here is we have a schema for the different indexes that we are using. If we enter in an index, for instance, Git, um, this index contains several different fields, right? Author date or, or author name are not a metric by themselves, but the metric is, for instance, how many authors, different authors we have, or uh, for how long have we, have we been producing certain number of commits over uh, five, for instance, or uh, give me the size of the usual commit in number of, of files or in number of lines, for instance, right? So there are not such metrics, but what we are doing is we have these big matrices of information. In this case, we have 54, well, 53, uh, different fields that we can aggregate and bucketize and characterize in the way we want to do this. So the number of potential metrics are 54 uh, multiplied by 54, right? So we can go any field with any field. Um, and then this is only for Git repositories. So if we go for others, as for instance, you were mentioning issues, there is another specific uh, CSV file with all of the information we are tracking. And these are for the, for the rich indexes. So uh, we have in Grimard Lab, we have raw indexes and then we have enriched indexes. Raw indexes are those that contain information as it comes from the data source, but uh, translated to JSON. And then enriched indexes are those that contain uh, this curated information with identities and certain common fields that we, we are interested in, in having across all of the indexes. So, uh, this is from the software perspective. Uh, if we go to the metrics perspective, which is the more theoretical side of things, then this, the discussion is different because then we may start finding a bunch of metrics uh, that matter to you, like having this high level discussion, and then we can go to the software implementation somewhere. But uh, so this is why I started the conversation with this uh, discussion about uh, goals yeah goals and questions because then we we can go to the specific metrics that uh, we can track because otherwise uh, the potential number of metrics that we can track is so big basically we have all of this oops sorry uh, we have all of these indexes that can be mixed and and, and massage and, and transform to potentially any metric so I don't know. I, I think I didn't answer your question, Peter. Yes, I think so. So how can we proceed? Should we go for perhaps a specific metrics that matter to you? Oh, sorry, not specific metric. Well, you mentioned some of them, but perhaps to some, some questions that matter to you. So then we can start discussing about metrics so for instance what what are the, the kind of uh, metrics that you are already tracking this might be another conversation hmm. okay I will um, I will get that uh, so what so so off the top of my head I don't have the list I have the VPN but the, well, I, I remember most of it so the number of stars mm -hmm. when is the last commit date? And when is the delta between the first time it was started and the very last time it was there, so that duration, how long did it last? That's one of the things. And we noticed some in GitHub, some of the projects got imported. So it's like, it's, it's like you started this project here, but the last commit was like 10 years ago or something. That, that also happens. But <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so some of those metrics, uh, were actually useful because you can tell a lot of projects were just like a one week old or one month old and then they just discontinued. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that those, I don't know if you track that. I think I saw something similar, but not the Delta. 
uh, yeah, the delta is one of those things that you can have. Oh, there's a massage a bit of information. So the information is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the number of participants, number and the, the number of Git committers, that's one of the mm -hmm. features. Number of uh, stars from GitHub. Uh, the number of, I don't think we went down to the uh, <clears throat> code level. I mean, the, uh, I think we went down to number of lines level, but we didn't go down mm -hmm. to comments versus lines or things like that. We didn't go down to the level. Mm -hmm. um, what else was there? Uh, the number of forks was one of the issues, one of the ways that we could discern the a number of issues resolved as well. That's another uh, dimension that we use. Mm -hmm. uh, what else was this? I think the size was one of them, like the the file size. I mean, not not the file size, total size of the uh, number the number of files as well as the size of the entire you know the binary. You know, how many bytes do you have in your uh, check out when you do the master one? Um, that's mm -hmm. that's one of them. The number of commits was definitely one of them, and the. Uh, So the way we handled it, it was that uh, we bucketed some of these, each of these dimensions, and we saw how it was uh, distributed. So we, we came up with a distribution model for each of these variables across mm -hmm. all of the Cs, all of the Java, and all of JavaScript, and then uh, started massaging the data a little bit. Uh, so those were the metrics that, that I remember. I think those were the most important ones. And even with the, the ones that I mentioned, not, not, not the comprehensive list that you guys have, even with those, we could come up with a predictive model that's pretty, pretty reliable, I'd say 80 to 90% accurate on um, just given any Java repository, can you predict whether it's going to be, whether it is active or not, and, you know, whether it's a very active one that we should be cataloging versus it's garbage, nobody's using it, you know, kind of deal. But it's not really that difficult problem if you think about it, because, you know, hello world, you, you can already tell it's going to be short and it's going to be not actively updated and et cetera, et cetera, you know. So, so for us, that's a starting point. Um, the, so that's, that's a, the OS catalog building side. There, there's one more use case that I told you about, the, the cybersecurity side. So that work is also published um, in OSS Summit at last year. Um, we use the BERT model. That's actually our intern, Jun Yang's work, is that uh, we use the BERT model. Is it, is it BERT stands for, it's a type of uh, text, uh, the, the name entity recognition model. It, it finds important information out. We use that to parse CV information and can you find the product name and the version of all the CV entries is what we worked on and link that across the OSS library. And uh, we were able to actually do it very accurately, uh, as good as human, I believe, and sometimes better than our other intern who was actually labeling these things. So um, that's kind of where we are at. Um, so those were the use cases that I had. It's, we looked at some type of cybersecurity information. We parse that using AI to kind of link that across the open source project versus what the description of this cybersecurity problem. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, so, yeah. okay. real, real quick, Peter, I, I'm trying to capture what you're saying in the meeting minutes. I don't know if you have an eye on what I'm writing because I want to make sure that everything is accurate. Sure, I will uh, take a look. I'm looking at the camera, but I'll start looking at that. I have two screens. <laughs> I'm still looking at the, uh, the, the document. Yeah. And I have it open in front of me. Okay, so right now, the last thing you said is under questions, where I added the question, yeah. can you find? And this is where I was not quite sure if I captured the question you are trying to address correctly. Yes, you, you got that correctly. Yes, thank you. So Peter, oh, I was question wondering. doesn't make sense to me. That's why. I'm <laughs> Can you find the product name, <laughs> the version number for CVE? That so 
maybe maybe I ask my the problem I have with this. Um, when I think of it in the CVE, it tells me already what product the CVE is for and what version is affected. So what is it that you're actually asking for here? So it turns out that if you really take a look at the data, it's actually dirtier than you think. Have you, have you had the experience trying to map what is, because they also have like some kind of product name and version that they use in, inside of CD items. So what's in the description versus what's in the actually, um, <clears throat> they wrote down on the, uh, uh, I forget the name of the field. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically like a CV ID or a CPE, yeah, a common product enumeration. So the CPE should give us the exact project name and the version range. Turns out that it's, there's a discrepancy between that versus the description. And we found that description is a little more accurate than the CPE. So it's really trying to way to deal with the um, with dirty data is what, I mean, I, I shouldn't call it dirty, but it's, 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 there's a discrepancy <laughs> we found. Uh, uh, Peter, I have a question for you. Hi, Peter. Yes. Yeah, I have a question for yes, you. Hi. So hi. what you guys are actually working on, is it something like the software uh, Betty Lunage? Like to find the provenance where a software entity is coming from and try to propagate it over time? That's right. You're correct. Okay. Okay, I see. Well, I think there are also good literatures concerning that uh, that in the there are good uh, it's, it's a good topic in the literature it has a, a lot of references at least i know a couple of yeah. Uh, yeah implementations that have used this of recent yeah if you can share that with me that would be great what we have found so far is somewhat there's inaccuracy quite a bit so we're trying to reduce that as much as possible okay yeah, like using which uh, um, model in your AI are you using? What kind of algorithm are you implementing? We implemented the name parser and the the version parser using the uh, the, the BERT model, the AI model, and it's 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 pretty effective. We found. Yes, um, but like which is algorithm is it? Um, which which algorithm are you using? Is it on deep learning, natural language processing? What kind of algorithm are you implementing? Because that also can have, ah, I see. Can have an impact on your training. Yes, so we, we are using deep learning techniques called the BERT, B-E-R-T. And uh, okay. we are using uh, Google's, I believe, trained model to okay. um, export, yeah. Any okay. yeah. Anyway, because sometimes the the AI model, sometimes traditional uh, software techniques have shown to to outperform most of these deep learning or AI models in software engineering uh, domains. For example, like in deep learning, if you train if you train a model using a different population, let's say Java source code, and you migrate it to try to work on Python. Uh, try to predict on Python, you have terrible results. You remember the Tesla car crisis that uh, they were, they was built in the US and they sent it to Australia to, to test? He could not identify, he saw kangaroo and could not identify what it, it was because it was straight. They did not have the concept of kangaroo in the US and things like that. So the oh, population and things. Yeah, so when you are using models like this, especially deep learning model, you also have to be careful. Sometimes these common methods that have been used and proven in software engineering common, are really performing well in most of the things. So try to look into different uh, existing technology, search-based uh, approaches. Yeah, genetic algorithms have been shown well uh, performant. So just think about that. But I do, I'll send you some of the papers that I uh, have seen uh, in, on this topic. I'll share it on the forum. Okay, great. The 
the what we have found is it's not it's not a difficult problem, but we we did see that. So what, the way we implemented it, just to add what we have done is that uh, we looked at the CPE, we get the name and the versions from that. We kind of have an idea of what it should be. So we go back to the description and we try to find the exact name of what we saw before. We encode it into the description and then try to find where that this the product name is and then where the version is. And a lot of times there's a little bit of discrepancy. So we... We try to add that in, in there to make it a little more accurate. But it's uh, it's I see your point that if if the data is not the underlying population is changing from one to the next, then this yeah. type of model does not work well. Yes, I totally agree with you on that. And uh, so luckily, the, the the data that we are looking at CV is somewhat, uh, you know, they they have CPE and then they have CV description and etc. So it was it was well structured. Okay. Um, kind of way of dealing with that data. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. So, Peter, would you, would you be interested in? So, while while you were discussing about this, I remember a paper I, I read years ago, and it was about uh, predicting kind of uh, uh, code smells. Uh, so, security issues as well. Uh, but instead of using the typical uh, source code metrics, they were using community-related metrics. So this is a paper from Nagapan, analyzing Microsoft development for Windows operating system. Um, and the point of this was that they were uh, predicting uh, in a more accurate way uh, some code smells, uh, given the community that was around this. And they were using specific metrics as, for instance, number of engineers uh, modifying the same file, a number of newcomers, so basically the seniority of the developers, number of senior people that were leaving the community or the project as well, and some others. Um, and with all of these metrics, what they were doing, they were creating some predictive model about uh, that was basically more accurate than the, than the source code. So I don't know if this is something that might be interested in this context. I see. I think I I read. I think I heard about it. I didn't read that paper. I'd I'd be very interested in uh, reading that. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. I heard that before. Is that the just based on which files are changed a lot over and over, and the which files mm. are discussed over email? That is actually a more accurate way than using static code than Office or some of the other tools. Is what I heard too. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's definitely a social aspect that brings the. Mm. Uh, because it's humans who create it. It makes sense to go back to that level. Sorry. Hmm. So th this is this is this is the area where definitely Grimoire Lab can can help, as you said, the, the social aspect of all of this. So uh, the uh, I I think you you already did it uh, this this analysis, but Grimoire Lab is focusing on mainly on activity in terms of counting events and and so on uh, events from any data source community. Uh, so the people and process, so the time to do certain things. Um, then the, there is there is another leg focused on static code analysis, uh, is which is part of Grimoire Lab as well. And I don't remember if we have license related uh, analysis. Uh, Valerio, maybe you can you can explain a bit more the the Graal side of things. Yes, do you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Uh, yes, I mean, Graal is uh, a recent component in, in Grimoire Lab. So, uh, basically, what it does is uh, uh, it iterates over the, the Git history, and for each commit, it runs an existing tool. So, we, we are not developing uh, our own tools to analyze the code. So, in terms of uh, license analysis, we rely on uh, Nomos and uh, on scan code. Uh, so basically for each commit we, we pass the files that have been modified in the commit and we return the result that Nomos would return if you launch it in a standard mode. So for instance, if you have uh, um, a source analysis tool to, and you want to get this data in Grimoire Lab, so the simple approach is to write a backend in Graal. And so then Graal uh, will take care of executing uh, the tool 
uh, on the full history of the repository in an incremental mode. So then you get this data and you can, can combine this data with uh, uh, the other data that the Grimoire Lab already provides. I don't know if this answers your question or clarify a bit more. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, coming back to the to the two questions we have in the document, the first one is, well, what projects do we need to keep copy in our internal database because the project is active and relevant to people? That's clear. The second one, so, I mean, it's clear the question. I'm not sure if this is somehow related to what Grimoire Lab can provide. Because my, my perception in the second question, which is can you find a product name and version number for CV items, for instance? Um, is, is this more- I'm sorry, the, 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 that, that's actually, I'm sorry, the, the, that's the question that we answered internally. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to give you a background of what we okay. are doing, but you can imagine that type of information can be, uh, how do I say that? In order to map, in order to track each OSS and cybersecurity problems within, within each OSS, huh. we do need to parse the uh, GitHub issues or Git log messages or, you know, the Bugzilla or something like that. And you guys seem to track that. That's why I kind of thought that, oh, yeah, you guys already have a parser that does that. Mm -hmm. We can utilize that uh, parser and then try to uh, uh, incorporate that in our overall uh, cybersecurity tracking project. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. In, so instead so of then, me, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So then this is not about, so this, is, this, this question is just about completeness of the data set that Grimoire Lab can produce, right? Not the specific metrics. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And and perhaps the other the other use case is this idea of uh, this social side of things about and related to security or back smells. Is this something that matters to you or not at all? I think that's that that's interesting to us. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I will add the, um, so I was looking for, well, yeah, I was looking for this name. Nachi Nagapan seems to be the, the author I was looking for. Uh, so at least for, uh, I mean, if, if we go now for the list of metrics, uh, I would say that Grimoire Lab is already providing or directly or indirectly this information. So for instance, the number of stars, this is supported, uh, but then we have like the delta between the first time and the last time information is there. Although I don't remember right now a panel that is kind of providing this info, but uh, can be provided definitely. Age of a project or number of committers, number of commits, number of lines, uh, I'm not sure if we can provide this differentiation between code lines and comment lines. Maybe maybe with crowd, I don't remember right now. And then forks or number of issues resolved. So most of them focusing to the to the first question you have are doable. And regarding to the second question, like social aspects, uh, if we, for instance, go simply to the Nagapan paper or any other aspect, I think they might be covered as well. Uh, do you have anything else in mind or any of the other attendees? No, this this is very helpful. If you guys already provide it, then we'd like to just participate and provide our in out input as well. <laughs> sure, would be good. I'd like to collect. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let me take note with respect to the second question. It's a matter of listing uh, one of 
metrics first step. Um, okay, so uh, Matt or Georg, so what on the rest of you, what do you think? So we have like the, the goals, the question, the metrics, we have the two use cases that might be the two questions we have in place. So I think it, this might be important for other uh, um, groups, maybe, like risk, perhaps. I don't know. What do you think? Sorry, what is the question again? I okay. wasn't out. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, so the question is, so we have these two use cases, which are, uh, well, what projects do we need to keep a copy in, in our internal database? And then basically they are active, so they might be relevant to people. And the second question is social aspects related to security in some projects. Uh, so we kind of have the two use cases with the two questions. And then we have like a bunch of metrics already in place for both of them. Uh, probably the metrics is something we, we may need to discuss a bit more. So it's like we can keep iterating. And then the question is, I think some of these use cases might be useful for other groups in working groups in chaos, right? So what do you think? Yeah, it sounds most relevant to the risk working group, especially when we talk about the licensing risk or vulnerability risk. Mm -hmm. um, and then which projects are active or relevant um, that could be, well, for one, it's a risk metric because that's business risk. Mm -hmm. People are choosing projects that are not going to be maintaining everything. Um, but it could also be relevant in the evolution working group conversation because that's where we try to identify projects that are where they are in the life cycle. Are, the, are these new projects? Are these projects that are growing? And, or are these mature projects that are just you know, being widely used? Mm -hmm. Or are they actually declining and people will stop using them? So I think those two working groups are most relevant to this conversation. OK. So then uh, in terms of producing specific uh, value for, for this group, perhaps the a good next step would be that we uh, we try to polish a bit the use case and then try to come back with, come back with a with a list of metrics that matter to each use case. So then we start creating a mockup for the dashboards. Does it make sense? Is that really what uh, what you need, Peter? A dashboard, or is there another way that you're trying to consume the data? We were thinking of consuming the uh, the raw data that some of the you know the Python packages that you have inside the Grimoire lab, and then that's so the, we were thinking of consuming it directly, like you know if you have the CSV file format or something. We were considering to do that at first, but I mean, if you if you have some other ways, we we are all open ears because uh, we're just starting to download and install and trying to figure things out because there are like five six components in there. So then uh, perhaps perhaps with that perspective, what we can uh, have as next step is there, you were gonna write something in the notes. I'm getting ready to write whatever. <laughs> okay, saying. I thought you were, you were writing some ideas. <laughs> uh, so then perhaps what we can do is to go uh, through the specific data sources that matter to you, uh, Peter. So you mentioned some of them, like GitHub issues or GitLab. Sure and then try to point to the right schemas and trying to build some kind of use case with this. Does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. And then perhaps from the data perspective, what we can show is uh, maybe, maybe offline or through the main list uh, or during the next meeting is to show you how perceivable works that might be the most interesting tool to start with because this is where you are going to start consuming JSON documents and then uh, how to have everything in place. 
Yes, that makes sense. And uh, we will we will try try install it, try it out, and then we will pick uh, one open source project or a couple, and then produce data and then see how it kind of interacts. And we'll do our homework before uh, next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, so it's eight minutes to finish the meeting. Probably we should leave like in two, three. Um, any other comments and so? So, Georg, what are you, what's blocking you from having the next steps in the doc? I'm writing an email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's like each time you are doing anything else and kind of, I know that you are doing that, so then I, I point to you, Georg. <laughs> I have no problem admitting that I'm not paying attention. <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Any other comment from anyone else? So maybe as next step, uh, Peter, you can yeah install things and check if it works for you. Sure, yes. So yeah, I guess this is all. So next week, next week we are changing time here in Europe. So uh, the time in the US should be an hour later, right? The time for all chaos meetings are fixed in US Central Time, so it'll oh. just be um, well, it's the other way around. So it's that you have to change your schedule, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah. No worries. Sorry about that. I know I hate <laughs> I hate the that we have daylight savings time and it messed up our schedule four times a year. Um, it's okay. So yeah, perfect. So Peter, if you have any question about the installation process or so, just simply feel free to reach the community through email or or yeah, any of this. Uh, IRC channels we have great. as well. Mm. So oh, I think great. It, yeah. So I think this is all for today. Uh, more questions? I gave you like two, three seconds. <laughs> no. no Gotta questions. go check up on my son. <laughs> okay. So all stay thank safe. You guys. Take care. Thank okay, you. you too. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Matt. See you later, Peter. Thanks for coming.